From Rixie, this is Frameform, a show about movies, moving, and everything in between. I'm Hannah Weber. I'm Jen Ray. And I'm Claire Schweitzer. Today's our first episode. We got some great stuff for y'all. We're going to talk about movies. We're going to talk about movies in dance. And uh, we're going to have some fun. So first off, how are you guys doing? First episode, pretty exciting. What have you all been up to? I'm like nerding out excited about this. I'm not going to lie. We've been talking about this for years and now it's like happening. So super excited. Yeah. I think today's topic is really essential and a good jumping off point. And I'm just excited to talk with you too because we've had many conversations like this and now we're, we're just doing it in a different format and get to share and expand the conversation with the world. Yes. Yeah. We have a lot of fun at festivals and this kind of show is just kind of like continuing that celebration of watching dance films, movement based films, screen dance, all of the above. So I'm really happy that we're doing this. Yeah, same here. And it feels like a really interesting time and actually a very relevant time to be doing something like this, too, considering that. Basically, every form of dance we see now is technically a dance film. So uh, <laughs> what better time to <laughs> start some deep dialogue about it? Uh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Let's talk about what we've been watching lately. I mean, we're here at home these days and, you know, there's so many streaming services as well as YouTube and Vimeo. Have you been watching anything interesting lately? I watched something really random last week. It has like almost nothing to do with dance, but I think it thematically touches on even some stuff we're going to talk about today. So my husband like found this movie on Netflix and said, oh my gosh, I loved this when I was a kid. It was so weird. It's called The Witches and it has um, <gasps> Angelica Houston in it. Yeah, Claire, like it is, yes. it's such a <laughs> weird movie, but I'm a big fan of, and Jim Henson did some of the the puppets for it. And I just really love like that sort of just manual filmmaking with, with not with CGI, just like stop motion and special puppets effects and like special effects. Yeah. It's, it just feels Good more like real special effects. Yeah. It, it like looks less quote unquote realistic, even though. I just find it's more real and enjoyable and kind of campy, but also super impressive. So that was such a weird movie, but I loved it. <laughs> was it a Jim Henson movie? Uh, I don't remember exactly what his role in it was. He might have just, I think he produced it maybe. Okay. Yeah, it was, like I said, very random. Came out of nowhere and it will stay with me forever. And it's on Netflix, you said? <laughs> yeah. Right. That was like one of those movies that like I'd see like I'd seen like a long time ago that indelibly traumatized me that I didn't really have much of a context for until I was older. Yeah, I could see a child watching that and then being like so confused. Like, is that really what people are like? It's just so strange, but also very funny. <laughs> awesome. Claire, have you been watching anything good? Yeah, I also watched a very strange movie recently. It's called A Field in England. Do tell. Yeah, so this is a film that's <laughs> on, I don't know, Jen, have you seen it? <laughs> no, but it sounds extremely unassuming. Yeah, so it's directed by, oh gosh, what's his name? Ben Wheatley, but he's a British director. And basically the film is about a bunch of soldiers in the English Civil War. This is like mid-17th century. And a series of very strange events uh, befalls them. And it's not necessarily like the events of the movie that are strange. It's the way that the movie tells of these events. So there are moments when like the, so the sound completely cuts out or like there's like a s sudden jump cut to another period of time. And love that. Yeah. And it certainly leaves a lot of space for questions after you watch it. So if you're interested in Twisting your mind a little bit. <laughs> Watch a field in England on Amazon Prime. A field in England. A, a field in England. Yes, a field in England. A field in England. All right, I'm definitely gonna have to watch this. I love, I love stuff like that. I also watched a pretty strange film the other day. 
I recently acquired HBO Max through my parents. I'm not oh, paying for yeah. it. <laughs> There's some like criteria and stuff on there as well as some like film classics. And one movie I watched actually literally like last night was this film called Schizopolis by Steven Soderbergh, which I highly recommend. I actually first saw this back in grad school. I had a teacher recommend it to me and I tried to watch it, but I like stopped. I don't remember why. I think it got too late or something. And then like I tried to revisit it and it was gone because it was actually on Hulu when Hulu was hosting Criterion Films. So I just didn't have the chance to watch it for a very long time. And then lo and behold, it's on HBO Max. So I sat down and watched it. It is a weird movie. It is a jigsaw puzzle. Literally, like, there's, like, a whole section in the film where, not a section, it's it's more like just a scene where this random side character is, like, talking to a woman, delivering fa- flowers to her, and they're just, like, jigsaw, jigsaw. Like, they're just talking in code. There's a lot of weird, like, broken dialogue, as well as, like, these like smash cuts of like random sections of like these news reporters telling us the news that doesn't make any sense and all of a sudden they're cussing on there and you're like well that wouldn't happen well maybe in 2020 it might (laughs) yeah I mean it's just like this it's this whole like narrative that's broken down into three parts and You have no idea where it's going until you get to the third section where you're kind of like, oh, okay, this is what's going on. I kind of get it now. But also, like, in the very beginning of the film, he tells you, Steven Soderbergh actually tells you, like, this is a movie. You're probably not going to get it. (laughs) That's your fault, not ours, which I think is so great. That sounds like such a grad school recommendation movie, like, so heady and strange. And, like, Steven Soderbergh, if you don't know, like, he's done, like, the Oceans movies. He did Aaron Brockovich. Recently, he did, like, Logan Lucky. Like, he does, like, a lot of... Oh, he also did Magic Mike. He does, like, a lot of big budget films that are, like, very, you know, box office focused. But at the same time, he can, like, make a movie that's just, like, out of left field and you're not going to understand it, which I think is brilliant. So I got to give it to him. I'm still not used to spelling things with the word Z. I told, like, well, I tell my students, like, in Canada, we say Z. And they're like, are you kidding me? (laughs) I said, yes, it's the same letter. We just say it differently. Anywho, let's talk about, (laughs) let's go into our main topic today. We're going to be discussing dance film. Basically, what is dance film? Y'all are trying to think. And um, kind of just give you an education or an introduction of what movement and film does for us. So why don't we have Jen bring us out? Because she, she has a good amount of experience of teaching dance film. She's a teacher, guys. This so. may come up a few times. Like, Jen's a teacher and she's Canadian. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Hannah. <laughs> I, this is one of my favorite topics within, well dance, film, screen dance, whatever, to talk about because there are so many different words for it. And I think that just having, just opening up the conversation, um, just by trying to define, like, I use this word versus that word, uh, gets things rolling. So common phrases, and even on this call, like, we all have different words that we prefer or that we would um, ascribe to different types of projects. So some common words that we hear might be screen dance or dance film or music video. When I was in film school, I I was also teaching dance and choreographing and I decided to call my company Dance Cinema because I was like, okay, it doesn't have the word screen. So it it allows some flexibility, like something on stage could still be dance cinema or something on screen. So yeah, there's different ways that we can combine the elements of dance and film. And what I usually do is I will... Whenever I have a, a workshop, I'll usually start with a Venn diagram. And on one half is dance, the other half cinema. And in the middle is obviously dance cinema or what do they share? And I think what we find is these overarching themes or almost the more general you get, the more it applies to both. 
And those are the elements that you can really leverage to make something strong, like rhythm, like movement, like composition, like color palettes, like texture. So yeah, I think that over the course of the season, we're going to talk a lot about different examples of not just videos you might see on the internet, but things you might see on, on a big screen in a public setting or in a theater or something more interactive or VR or AR. But all of these are topics that are on the table for us, which is really exciting. Yeah. I think the first thing that we really need to bring to the table is the question of like, where have I seen a dance film or dance in film? Um, Would we consider a music video a dance film? Uh, Claire, can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, music videos are kind of uh, tricky territory as far as dance film goes. So, I mean, the term I prefer is personally is screen dance as to me like other kinds of terms that describe dance film like video dance film dance or like cine dance describe the way the film is made and screen dance refers to the way the film is seen which on in most places is either a computer screen or a movie screen i mean it's more computer or a phone screen at this point nowadays (laughs) and It's a form, it's a hybrid form that combines the languages of dance and film to create something entirely new. And in some circles, and I mean, again, academics have argued about this term for years and years and years, and I think they will continue to argue about it for years and years and years. Long live the argument. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) But like a lot of the debate centers around like, what do we include within dance film and what do we not? And there are many in the academic community who do not include music videos within dance film, with the idea being that all the elements of the film are created in service to the music. And so the hierarchy of elements is really, you know, music overrides everything else. That being said, there are some music videos that sort of play with the music video form itself, where the music is very much integrated with the more filmic elements. And it's not the overriding thing that you notice or that you're watching the film for. And you see a lot of people today releasing, like, terming the music videos that we would know or that we commonly see as short films or like a short film, including this song. So I think that some music videos can definitely count as screen dance. I think to me, Michel Gondry's work, Spike Jones, like I think that absolutely counts because it really is, you know, every element is hand in hand with one another. But yeah, but that's always up for debate. Yeah, I think I I definitely agree with you there. I mean, we can't just say that music videos are dance films because the music is honestly the centerpiece and not the expression of movement itself. So when we push these topics forward, this is something that has to be, you know, remembered constantly to people that are not informed or not studying dance film. Like, it's not about the music. You don't just slap it on there. Uh, it is it is an intentional tool as a motivator, but honestly, it's all about the language of what we're seeing on screen and how it's also delivered through such things like cinematography and editing and sound. Precisely. That is a huge component into that. And um, let's just go right into it. So dance movement used for the camera, how are we using it? How are we seeing it? So when it comes to um, creating dance movement for film, I think that it's really important to understand the different ways that movement can be captured on film and and specifically think of things that you can do in a filmic space that you can't do in a performance space. So, for instance, you can get extreme close ups of um, like a shoulder moving and just seeing like the rippling image that the movement of the the movement of those muscles creates. And and also your every I I think when it comes to screen dance, every element of the film is involved is a choreographic piece like the the camera is a choreographic piece. The you know, the cuts are choreographic pieces. And uh, to me, like with when it comes to dance film, every like you're not just using the common like, you know, space, time, dynamic and what's the fourth element like rhythm. And um, you're not just using those set, you know, that are created specifically for one space anymore. Like you're they're being transmitted to a totally new, new realm and a totally new medium. Yeah. Like dance film is 
uh, I think people kind of get confused with that term sometimes or even screen dance and think that, oh, if I just use a camera involved, like that's, you know, considered dance film. It's like, <laughs> no, honey, I'm sorry. There's a little bit more to that. Uh, you can't just say that you, you know, you put your camera on a tripod and then you start dancing in front of it. I'm like, and doing a routine, like that's what we call a class video. That's something that you, you know, are documenting and putting up on, you know, Facebook, Vimeo or YouTube. I mean, it's more thought intentional. Like you said, Claire, you're putting the camera in places of the body than just kind of like this wide angle of just like, you know, you could stand there and do whatever, but it's more about, I think it's more about planning. I think it's more about thoughtfully exploring places. It's more about cutting and moving at like the, both the camera and the dancer are moving together. If anything, everyone is choreographing in this kind of mode. Definitely. I love that. I'm glad I'm going last because I'm going to touch on both <laughs> things that you both said. So first of all, what Hannah just said about it's all choreography. Yeah, every layer is choreography. The the camera and how it dances with um, the subject and how you use the space and the architecture as part of your mise-en-scene, as part of your site-specific choreography, um, it's all part of the dance. And then editing, of course, or the choice not to edit is a choreography choice. If I had to make a list of, of golden rules or like introduction to how to make this sort of stuff, I would encourage everyone to understand what each department does because I feel like even for a dancer to understand, oh, this is how it actually looks on a 2D surface or here's what that camera looks like um, with this movement or, you know, if they don't understand, uh, if, if maybe the cinematographer doesn't understand how editing works, it's going to change the kind of shots they get and the kind of movements. So definitely that interplay of all the elements is really important. And, um, and then what Claire said about uh, time, space, rhythm. Absolutely. Yeah. Those elements are so key here. And I think a way of characterizing it for, for stage or studio versus for screen is in a conventional performance setting or in a, in a rehearsal setting even, you have time and space and rhythm expression as, as is possible within reality and, um, you know, the, the constraints of what that dancer or those dancers can do. And what is actually present in in that moment. Whereas with film, you can go back and edit. The, the amount of manipulation and layers of choreography is so much more rich. And it, it's, it's never going to be like a live performance where you can hear the dancers breathing and see the beads of sweat. But I'm really interested in, in these other forms because of all those different layers that can, that can interact with each other and create something that's unique and new. Dance, film, screen dance, it's all about changing the lens. I mean, when we're watching a performance where everyone is participating and seeing pretty much the same thing, where dance film, you have a lot more control of what the audience is seeing through an individual lens. Who could that be? That could be the dancer's choice. That could be the director's choice. That is also the editor's choice as well as the cinematographer's choice. It's everyone being involved and with that said because dance film or this kind of style this mode of filmmaking you know everyone should learn about it why is it relevant why do we think that this is a topic worth talking about or even just you know making oh my goodness well i think that i mean we're we're recording this uh, at the at the beginning of July uh, 2020. And I mean, we saw how the world changed almost overnight. All of a sudden it was, things were already shifting online. It was already there as an option, but there was like a necessity all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So I think more it, for the people that weren't already dabbling with technology and dance, I think they're realizing, oh, if I want to, hmm, if I want to stay, it's not even stay relevant from a, from a social status standpoint, it's like if I want to continue to be able to make work, um, I need to get on pace with this. Even if you just want to do um, live events or performance, having some ability to capture those videos and um, 
you know, be a little tech savvy will, it, I would argue, is is necessary going forward, even if you're not making films, um, dance films specifically. You know, it's it's a skill and it's it's some it's part of our reality now. Absolutely, Jen. I totally agree. And yeah, we're getting into a new era where, yeah, just as Jen, as you were saying, that uh, people have to get on board with not only technology, but with the way that film works and that the way that their work is perceived through film. And I think we've seen this already, like when it comes to recorded dance performances, I mean, they're just a facsimile of the real thing. Like every time, like the moment that a dance performance goes into the the camera space, it becomes something else entirely. It becomes sort of like a mimicry of what was originally there. Yeah. And so now, like we're seeing all these streams of these, I mean, incredible dance works that were created for a very specific place in a very specific time. And I think this era is going to not only, I mean, not only change the way that we see dance, but it's also going to change uh, the way that the choreographers conceive of the work that they're already doing. And in a way, they have more a bigger audience for their work now because they can just put it online and people can watch it. But now they're also considering like how, 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 how can this be engaging to more people? And like, how can this be re yeah. How can this be reframed in a way? No, no pun intended. (laughs) (laughs) I personally think dance film is relevant because it is such a, widely understandable widely understood i don't know i'm trying to say it's like universal it's like math basically you know if you study it you're gonna understand it and if you don't study it you know that two plus two equals four you know that you know (laughs) nine times six is what is Is what (laughs) i don't remember at the moment (laughs) sorry don't judge me i'm a video editor not a mathematician but you know, like you can pick if you don't study, you know, dance cinema, you can understand a little bit of it at some point. You know, you can understand body language, you can understand emotion, you know what red means. Red is usually bad or evil or mad or anger or intense or passionate. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> like we understand colors. We understand it's it's I mean, it's the coll- the collision between like what you see every day and what you see at the movies, you know, like that is what dance film is, basically. And I think what's so different about it from like dialogue and acting, you know, it's because of that you can see these emotions, you know, like the films that we're going to talk about in a second show very different kinds of examples of what a film could be if it just had dialogue. You know, it would be a totally different film. It could be a darker film than a joyous film. You know, it just, how can we change topics and make them the opposite of what they're supposed to be? You know, what do you guys think? Why is it, why do you think, how could it be different? How could a film, a dance film be different if it uses dialogue and acting instead of movement? I think it'd be appealing to a very different experience or a very different, um, yeah, or very different knowledge base of experience. And quite frankly, it would be appealing to a knowledge base that people are already quite familiar with. Like, I mean, I'd say that when I, I'm totally generalizing here and feel, feel free to send me any stats if I'm wrong, but most people communicate with each other through words, whether it's the spoken word or the written word. So if they have dialogue, it's something that's much more familiar and something like a line that they can follow. But with body language, unless you're specifically trained in it, that's a little bit more difficult to follow. or That's a little bit more difficult to pick up. So, you know, but it's communicating something entirely, entirely different in an entirely new way. That's interesting that you say that, that you think people don't pick up body language which I think is probably true maybe I'm just so used to like looking at people every day like my day job as an editor I'm looking at those weird kinks that people pick up when they're doing like delivering lines or after they deliver a line that I can pick up on the discomfort in people's voices or even just in their body or if they have just something off about them 
Yeah, I was watching something on um I was actually watching the morning show on Apple TV Plus and the last few episodes uses a lot of body language because they don't the character cannot like they can't say what they are feeling. It's all in the body language. So like I'm talking to my partner and he's like no, she said she's fine. I'm like, does that look like she's fine? Because she it doesn't. It's like, this isn't like when I say I'm fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I I don't know. I'm indifferent about that. But I, I do see your point there, Claire. Jen, what do you think? Well, I think often when, when you have... I'm going to be speaking in generalizations. Don't come for me, everybody. So generally, <laughs> dancers can be dancers first. And maybe actors second, actors and actresses second. Sometimes they're not at all. Sometimes dancers have, a, a, they can be so confident in that language, in that dance language, with their dance vocabulary and with that kind of expression. But if you ask them to speak publicly, whether it's off the top of their head or a line, it's, it's a totally different thing. Of course, there's some incredibly talented people that can dance and sing and act and play music and so costumes like right with their toes right right with their toes like there's there's a lot of um of course there are many people that possess all these talents but i think in general when someone goes to set out to do a dance focused project they're not always thinking and how do we write dialogue and of course writing dialogue is such a challenge to write it so that it's natural and organic oh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. and the audio recording part of it like it's definitely um not simple but something that I do really like about dance film, and this is part of why I really try and um, expose like children and teenagers and families and like other people that are not involved with dance to it, is that it, it develops media literacy. You know, we are just so overwhelmed with media that we it's you don't always think critically. You're just stuff's just funneling into your brain, passively taking it in. Exactly. So if you have a small dose of nonverbal communication, like a three-minute film where you have to figure out the story and there's no voiceover saying, once upon a time, this happened. Don't you see it? It's happening on the screen. There we go. On to the next thing. Um, it can be done really effectively, but not always. Um, so, yeah, I really do like how dance film or screen dance offers that opportunity for interpretation and the fact that you will get different interpretations for different audience members the same way you would with words. but. I feel like it's almost even more open and abstract sometimes. Yeah. And um, I have to say that in my experience watching films, the more um, attempts at voiceovers or subtitles to um, certain movement goes without any spoken dialogue within the film itself, the less it works for me. Because at that point, you're really trying to prescribe a very specific experience. And with the dance film, it, you know, again, like body language really reads differently depending on where you are in the world and you, the work that you make is going to have such different resonances with, with other people. And I think that's something that you have to be understanding that it's, you know, your work is going to be experienced differently 10 times by 10 different people. Yeah. And that, tr that triggered something for me, Claire. Um, not bad. Good. Something <laughs> triggered. I am really triggered right now, but in a good way. <laughs> um, so when you talked about the, the kind of global audience for it and that um, context is important and that the same movement might be interpreted different ways, that's something that is so cool when you have a film that doesn't have any talking in it, whether it's voiceover or spoken, because it truly does. Like, of course, we've all heard like dance is a universal language. Music's a universal language. Obviously, people that know the technique more might understand the language more or less. But in general, an audience member can just receive audio visual sensory experience that doesn't have words more directly in a way that um they might not be able to if there was that barrier of okay now I got to read the subtitles I love subtitles but I know some people are just it's a lot to multitask and the more you're reading text the less you can watch the dancing and as Claire's famously said kinesthetic empathy can go a long way <laughs> what makes this film what makes this uh mo what makes this mode experimental and like all forms of art or maybe not all forms, but most forms of art, you know, you're in a museum, you're looking at that Picasso, you're looking at that uh, whatever piece of modern art, maybe 
that you're looking at and everyone has that different emotion or that different reaction to it and that's what dance does to people what movement does to people and like i said experimental it, would you consider this experimental i ca i have like a mix between a mixed yeah. answer i think it's i think it's experimental because it's not normal to the general public it's different you know with, with, with dance recitals is one kind of thing and then dance film dance cinema screen dance is another kind of you know they're two different people they're two different <laughs> things we should say I wish the listeners could see your hand gestures right now. <laughs> like Hannah's like showing us the two separate things. <laughs> They're two different animals, you know, like, I mean, one is just with ex when I say experimental and it's because of all the things that we've been discussing, it has more editing. There's more sound design. There's more discovery through the process. We could say not everything has to be planned out. But that is intentional at times. But I think with dance film, especially, it's like experimental film where you're just kind of discovering and excavating and looking through the edit, looking through the camera lens, looking through or listening through what sound effects come up in the movement. And that creates a story of its own. It's the artist's process. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think this is going to come up with both of our examples today, but I'm sure there are um, some uh, that there might be some more scholarly film folks. And obviously, three of the, three of them are right here. But I, I mean, people that are very particular on note, this is what an experimental film is. I'm sure there would be those that have a clear idea of what experimental film is and might not count something that's maybe more um, narrative as experimental. And that's something that is interesting because with, with dance film or screen dance, we do talk about alternative narratives. And it's not always beginning, middle, end, uh, logical plot and dialogue to help you along the way. Uh, it is more of a of an exploration both with on the production side on like how are you finding new ways and new camera movements and new editing structures and new ways of expressing a message with the, with the unconventional means. But... I would say that I would imagine there would be some that think, okay, if this is more narrative or direct, even if it is without words, it's probably not as experimental. But there's definitely some films that I would say for sure would fall more into the experimental category, and dance certainly helps with that. Yeah, and I think the word experimental comes loaded with like lots of different meaning, and that if you see something that's labeled experimental as a genre or experimental, like experimental film program that an audience going into like going to watch that film or going to watch that program is going to have a preconceived idea of what experimental means. And that yeah. can be you know, a deterrent for some people that can be include like that can um, draw some people in. And it's also completely relative to where you are. Like, for, for instance, if like an experimental screen dance in in the States might not be considered experimental screen dance. And again, I'm so sorry for stereotyping in like Montreal or in Europe yeah. or something like that. And it all really depends on what your audience's familiarity with film is and how that familiarity can be you know, disrupted or decentered in a way. I think that goes for like just all countries in general. I mean, watching a Japanese film is completely different from a Hollywood narrative, I would say. It's definitely a different kind of pace. I think, yeah, I think that just goes for all form of watching. So our first film that we're going to discuss today is the film titled Colorwise, which features the Seaweed Sisters. That includes Megan Lawson, Jillian Myers, and Dana Wilson. And Colorwise is directed by Angela and Ithel. Jen, this was actually your pick. Yes, ma'am. Every Seaweed Sisters film is going to be my <laughs> pick for all eternity. I am such a huge fan. Um, so this film was, their, I believe, their fourth film. They have a, a more recent one out called Rather Important that I was kind of like on the fence. Do I pick that one or Colorwise? But Colorwise is just 
such a classic that um, it's probably a little easier to digest for for newbies than rather important. But I would describe them as auteurs. Um, in cinema, we we have a that phrase. I'm sorry, I sound super pretentious right now, but it's when there's like a clear artistic vision that transcends any singular work. It's part of their body of work and their identity. And like, you can see something and within a couple seconds know like, oh, that's that director. Like Wes Anderson, for example. Yeah. If you see a tidy color palette and everything's organized, pretty much know it's one of his movies. So the Seaweed Sisters are like that for dance, I believe. And um, so this film, they have their iconic colors that are associated with their individual costumes. And they really played on that concept for this film. And, um, you know, color sort of used to as a character and as something that drives the narrative in a way in this film. Yeah. And I mean, their dancing is just so on point and they're so together. They just they dance as if they're one person, but they're so clearly three individuals with three separate identities. It's just a treat. And yeah, I, I can't say enough amazing things about them and their work. But this film, I think, is really special. And we've screened it at so many events like uh, in Vancouver, in DC. I've screened it at dance studios. I've, I've, I've just seen like the reaction online. Like people love this film. And, you know, it was even selected for Standard Vision's um, showcase. So I actually got to see it on like a four story high screen outdoor. And it was, it was just as impactful on that huge screen. So I think there's something to be said too for a film that can be so flexible that it looks amazing on a laptop screen. It looks amazing on a cell phone and it looks amazing um, four stories high. I remember seeing this and thinking how awesome it was. Just to say, I mean, you were saying about color pushing the narrative and how it's a great, like, digestible film. Claire, what do you think about how this is a great example of dance film? Well, first of all, and I don't know if it was intended as a music video or not, but this is a, a perfect example of, a, I guess, a music video style film that I would absolutely consider screen dance. Because, again, like we experience this film and the music is a, certainly an element to um, pushing the story along, but it's not the overriding element. Like, yeah, I, I don't know if this is going to sound great, but I kind of forgot like the, the music was there in some places. I mean, that sounds <laughs> sorry. That sounds terrible. But but the thing is, like, I was so uh, wrapped with the visuals and the the way that the story moved along. And I also think it's really interesting. We're going to, uh, to talk about in a second about creating this um, on-screen world. And the on-screen world, this is certainly a very unique on-screen world, one that <laughs> exists within its own logic and its own physicality. And it really is the physicality that, you know, drives this film forward. Um, I'm just thinking there's that one moment, I think, uh, where we have um, two of the two of the sisters have their colors. I think Jillian's in the middle without hers. And like the difference in movement quality between the two on the outside and Jillian in the middle is just so pronounced and just works so well and specifically works so well in that you know screen environment and the logic that that world has created. So truly something that would be very difficult to capture in a live performance. I think what's so fantastic, um, which brings the film element, is just when everybody finds finds their color. I mean, you can't see that in a documented space. You know, it has to be, you know, we got to trick the viewers that, you know, when, for instance, one character sees a flamingo and, you know, she gets sprayed with the flamingo's fart, you know, (laughs) and she turns magically pink... I'm sorry, it's not that much of a spoiler alert, but, you know, it's such a great reveal of how people are changing into these personalities. I mean, color pushing the narrative forward, it's like finding your color, finding your yourself. And I think that's like with that idea in mind, like that's not going to play well. Well, I personally don't think it would play well as a dialogue. Not at all. Did you guys think about that at all? Like, how would dialogue be played in this kind of film? I mean, Jillian's dance would have been so melodramatic if it was a speech. Like, everyone has their color and I don't have mine yet. 
there's something um, super playful or not something like their choreography is super playful and fun. And I think that it just adds to the that giddy energy and that exploration as you're watching the film. And yeah, it is something that I think is such an important message, too. And, um, you know, the idea that they are all on their own path. They all have their individual journey to find their unique personality or selves or their own color. And they all discover it a different way at their own pace. And I just think that it's it's so well told through dance. It's it's such a simple yet profound concept. And, you know, it wasn't even like the film felt heavy or patronizing with that sort of message. It was just fun throughout and just told in a way that you only could do in in this environment, on a screen, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Precisely. And I was just thinking that if this had dialogue, I have a feeling the film would be two, three times longer than it is. (laughs) Uh, Like, it really tells the story the way it needs to tell the story. And I appreciate how visually they kind of set up, they propel the narrative forward as well. Like, I like the way that we see sort of like the little spot of color, like the blue ball or the pink flamingo, before, you know, the the dancer turns blue or pink. And um, there's a sense of tension that, okay, we've established this color. We've established that they're in white suits. Mm -hmm. When's it going to happen? Yeah. When is this, you know, the world going to see, you know, seem colorful now? Yeah. And even in that space is so, you know, it doesn't have a legit location. It's just kind of this blank slate that, you know, when they have like things kind of, you know, they're going through fount- the, like a little waterfall. They're going through puddles. You know, it's really fun. And like, again, like you can't really document that through dialogue or even through an audience. It's all about, again, how do we show the viewer what we're seeing, how the director is seeing it or how the Seaweed Sisters are seeing it. I think part of what makes us really strong as well, and this is something that's in their other films too, is just the detail and the costuming and the props. Oh, um, yeah. If, even if it, sometimes if there's a prop, the whole project revolves around it. Here, it's like, we're going to use umbrellas because they're awesome and they match our outfits. Okay, next scene. Um, it's just, it, it helps things move along. And I also have to say, I really was struck by the costumes because they're fun. Like, everyone loves the blow-up suits, in a world where we are watching so much dance and it's increasingly um, sexualized and it's increasingly like there's more skin, there's more intensity. Mm-hmm. Like, yep. it's so nice to just actually see dance that's not about, look how in shape they are. Yeah. Like, they're amazing dancers, but we're not like watching their six pack yeah. in this, you know? Um, the costumes serve a great function in the story. It adds to the fun and the whimsy, but it also just removes that element as well, which I don't even know if that's something they meant to do, but it's something that I certainly see as a great strength because it changes our focus as we're watching. I definitely recommend watching, uh, I think it's called, is it called Water Fountain? They're, uh, they're short where they dance to tune yards. Yes. That one is a great one, too, where it's, you know, they're not, again, it's not physicality of their body. I mean, there's physicality, obviously, but it's like, it's all focused about, you know, they're stuck in the desert and they're dehydrated and they're just like, what now? What am I going to do? And I love how that that one is just like played out. And for film nerds, like, there's some Western references in there, too. Yeah. So it's kind of satisfying when you're like, oh, I recognize that. <laughs> I actually haven't seen that. but <laughs> Oh, you should definitely watch it. I definitely recommend everyone to uh, subscribe to the Seaweed Sisters on their Vimeo account as well as their YouTube. They just have such great stuff. And, again, if you want to see some really clean lines in their movement, that one is a great one for you. You're welcome, world. Yeah, you're welcome, guys. Your life's better now. (laughs) Congratulations. (laughs) So, I mean, we were talking about, like, narrative in dance film with this one. How would you say that narrative dance film, like, playing into dance film? Because it's like, can that actually happen? And the answer is yes, of course. You could definitely make a dance film that has a narrative as like the main theme you know there's a clear beginning sometimes i'd like to say that the middle is where we get to play and have experimental qualities to it it's more looser 
you don't know what's going on or you know what's going on and then you have a clear ending what else would you have to say about narrative in dance film well i think that narrative um in dance film can take several different forms there's the narrative that we're used to seeing which is sort of like the sequence of events like here's you know this you know this this happens and then we have our middle coming to a climax and then it gets to an ending um but it, it can also function um Dance film also has the ability to communicate a narrative that's not built on a series of events, but is is built on a series of energy and series of dynamic. Mm. And I like yeah. that a narrative in dance film can um, take the form of a series of um, a sequence of energy and dynamic that comes to a sort of revolu- resolution or not. It doesn't have to be just a sequence of events like we're following this one dancer through like through the forest. I hope they make it through the forest. And it can instead be like, okay, we're seeing a dancer walking through a forest and they're going through this experience by the way, like that they're, um, they're moving through it. It's Goldilocks. <laughs> it's Goldilocks and the three bears. Yep. I'd actually pay to see that film, you know, three, three portraits of Goldilocks. Filmmakers, you heard it first. Claire is willing to spend money to see your Goldilocks and the three bears <laughs> film. Please make it. Frameform Podcast is commissioning a work to make a Goldilocks-inspired film. Just kidding. We're not. (laughs) But we'd love to see it. Claire, I think that's an interesting take of the narrative playing with speed and rhythm. I think that's more almost kind of like a, almost like a stage idea. Like, you know, when you think of watching classic dance works on stage you know you have a clear beginning middle and end through how it plays out and it's not just a story it's just kind of like how energy is played and I've definitely have made films in the past or dance films exactly like that what would you have to take away from that Jen using making films that are narrative in that sphere Mm. I think there's there are infinite this is like, such, sounds like such a cop-out answer, but I'll back it up. There are infinite possibilities. And I totally agree with what you're saying, that dance is uh, and film both have the ability to portray like energy and mood really well. Um, and I think this is why a lot of people might rely on music so much or lyrics, um, because it gives you a clear message that you don't have to write dialogue because you can hear lyrics. I'm going to use ballet as an example quickly because I think that I mean, when I teach ballet, this is some this is something I say to students, right? And I'm not saying like ballet's the the most important or anything like that. I'm just speaking specifically about certain characteristics of ballet and how ballet uses narrative. A lot of classical ballets, if you read them or if you um, see them, they're so they're so dramatic. They're melodramatic. They there's life and death. There's there's marriage and there's betrayal. There very like iconic characters because you weren't using words you had to use such dramatic like tropes in the story and have such clear-cut characters and even have mime and these sorts of very clear um what would almost read as maybe cheesy nowadays uh, or definitely read as cheesy like you know the this was sort of a necessity for i don't want to say immature audiences but audiences at an earlier time that didn't have the same level of interpretation skills and literacy that we do because of what we're exposed to uh, over time. So I think that we are, we're in such an era where we can't separate from technology as much for a large part. And I do think that it kind of, at the same time, people, I think a lot of people want to watch a dance film or a screen dance and be like, okay, but what's the story? It's not always going to happen. Sometimes the story is just this occurred for the duration of the video that you watched and what struck you in that time. And for me, of often that's enough. I don't need a clear narrative. I, I, I care more about those specific choices that go into create a cohesive world um, or a mood or something that it's more about does this feel complete as it is regardless of me being able to explain a plot. Though sometimes when it's done well, it's, uh, it's really effective. And I'm sure there'll be many examples throughout the season where we'll say, yeah, this is something that's more narrative driven and here's how it, we think it was achieved. Um, or at least as an audience, how we were able to kind of connect those dots a little bit. So for our second pick going into a classic 
uh, a study in choreography for the ca- for a camera, excuse me, by Maya Darren and Tally Beatty. Uh, would you consider this work to be a narrative film? Mind you, this is 1945. This is a 1945 film. I think in the world that it establishes, I absolutely do think it's a narrative film that mm. we do follow. I mean, maybe we don't exactly know who this dancer is or how they're, you know, transcending space and time to step, you know, to do a relevé law into one place and step into a different place entirely. But I feel that there's like a sort of a progression and that progression is created with the relationship between the camera and the dancer and the moments that we um, the camera is moving and is somewhat losing the dancer in a way. And sometimes that the camera is very, very close to the dancer. Let's do a a brief introduction to Maya Darren. We can post a show uh, a link in the show notes for those who are more interested. But Maya Darren is a very important person. Very yes, Claire. Yeah, very uh, important um, person to understand to in order to understand where a lot of current um, dance film comes from. So um, she was born in, I believe, she was born in Ukraine. Moved to the states when the revolutions were starting and um, her family was being persecuted and actually didn't have a formal background in dance. Um, I think her primary background was in journalism, but she was fascinated with the body and sort of um, somatic embodied movement as well, and specifically embodied movement as ritual. She was a secretary for Catherine Dunham. Catherine Dunham is another dancer in the African style of movement. Yep. Um, and then met a filmmaker, Alexander Hamid, and um, crafted a bunch of really short experimental films. And keep in mind, this was an independent filmmaker working in the 1940s at a time when cameras were not um, readily available or accessible or cheap. Um, yeah. Neither was any you know, sound equipment or, or the like. So a lot of her films were silent films. And... It's definitely important to understand the context of which where these films were screened at the time as well. And if you have ever been to a film screening where it's the film is being played from an actual film reel, an actual film projector, like the sound of the projector is, you know, creates a sense of a rhythm like. (laughs) 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 But also the, the way that the the movement and the cuts are made, it's, it creates its own rhythm that makes sense within the, um, the logic of the film itself. And we get into sort of the muddy territory of dance film versus movement-based film versus choreographic film, because Maya Darren explicitly viewed all of her films as choreographies. Yeah. Even in films that like Meshes of the Afternoon or At Land, where maybe we don't recognize any specific dance movement, She's conceiving of the use of space and the use of time in a very choreographic manner. Claire, I don't think you know what you're talking about. I'm just kidding. You're such a pro. And like, I just love what, like we'll have future rewinds where Claire's uh, schooling us all in our history. And I just thank you. Thank you for that context, because I think it's so easy to just look at a year and be like, oh, that's when something came yeah. out. But to have actual context and understand the economics and the technology at the time yeah. and other cultural contexts like this was I, I mean, if her family was being persecuted, I would say she was probably more of a refugee than an than an immigrant, you know, and this is someone that came to America and was like, I just want to, you know, not just but she part of her life here was I want to create I want to study choreography and I'm just going to do the thing. And it doesn't matter that I'm not a trained dancer. I think that's a really beautiful and inspiring thing for us to to ponder. Yeah, my Darren was like a rocket ship. She just went out and did it and was very inspired by movement. Um, Just to go back to the film itself, a study in choreography for a camera. I know it's a 1945 film. I know that Maya Darren is an auteur of her own, that she would say. But I, with my trained eye or my uh, personal artistic eye, I would like to argue that this film is a movement-based film strictly on the exploration of editing. Uh, It's definitely, to me, just 
a huge experiment. I think she was trying new things that she hasn't done before. I think it was just like, how do we play with matching action? How do we transport the dancer from environment to another environment? To me, we've heard things uh, where dance is transformative. You know, you can be dancing and you feel like you're in your you're in a totally different place. And this film definitely exemplifies or is a great example of that nature. You know, we start with a dancer in a jungly kind of environment to a home. Who knows? He could have been at home the whole entire time. It's the way we express it, as well as moving into a museum. I think what's interesting about this film for that time, though, is also Tally Beatty itself, because we don't really see the black body on film. So again, it's kind of another way of exploring, you know, not just matching action, but exploring a different, for that time, colored body. If Maya Darren was uh, Catherine Dunham's, you said secretary? I believe so. I wonder if she just saw him in rehearsal and was like, he is exquisite because he is yeah. like, I love his movement. Um, It's been described as like a, a mix between jazz and ballet, not like lyrical. Often we talk about like lyrical dance, at least in dance studios, when you're trying to give like the, the pitch on like, what's a lyrical class dance, uh, jazz plus ballet set to lyrics in your choreography usually quite pretty, sometimes upbeat and happy. Um, but his his style is jazz and ballet, and I have this great quote for him. So from him. So he says, his self-described style is a mixture of Graham connective steps, Dunham technique, and a little ballet with Louisiana hot sauce in it. Bluesy. Because he did train... <laughs> Louisiana hot sauce in I love it. that. Because he did train with Dunham and Graham, and you can see that movement in there. But um, if we're talking preference... I'm not always that into contemporary and modern as much. I know they're both different, but I'm also not into either totally as fair. much as I am into other styles of dance. Um, it's totally a fair girl. <laughs> Who cares? Like, I, I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at you. <laughs> right? And I just think that um, this this film, as an exploration of choreographic exercises, has such great moments that are... Um, not really focused on like, oh, we're watching this style of dance. Um, like, I think it's even a great tool to just explain certain phenomenon, like, or phenomena, plural. So like the leap that just lasts like half a minute and that we cut and we can see it in space. It's really saying like you're using the fact that it's filmed to enhance what that jump is. Because in rehearsal, we might be like, all right, and jump through the ceiling and never come down. You're going to come down. But the idea is that you never will. So this suspends reality in a great way. And my absolute favorite moment is the statue that's facing both direct. Is that a statue of uh, Janus, maybe? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, but the, the statue's facing both directions, and his turning just gradually increases. And it gives the idea of when you're technically spotting, um, or when you're using proper technique when you're spotting your head, it can create that blurring mm-hmm. effect. And I just, like, that. that's my favorite moment that will always stick with me from this film, even if, um, yeah, even if otherwise it's not... I this is another part where people are going to come for me. I don't I can appreciate uh my Darren is a pioneer, but I know that it's not the most accessible material for a lot of people. And the goal is not to always be accessible, mm-hmm. but I do think there are clear um points that we can we can find in this film and in her work in general and her uh place in history that clearly define her uh, as a pioneer of of this hybrid form for sure. As the debate st- debate stands, it, would we consider this as a dance film, a choreographic film, a movement-based film? What could we say? I say it's a movement-based film because I think it's more about the exploration. I think, um, well, it depends on what context and like what else you're relating it to, in a way. Because it does feature, I mean, it's dance in the way that it does feature a dancer and someone with you know, very trained dance movement. It's choreographic in the way that it, you know, cuts between that movement and really plays with space. And something about Maya Darren that's also important to know is that she was really interested in conceiving dance film, not just as a film that depicts dance, but a film that evokes the 
experience of dance. But then the, comes the, the eternal question. Do we, is creating choreography necessarily the same as creating a dance? Like, where do we differentiate that? Is, you know, just a single Batma in isolation, can we consider that choreography? I mean, it is movement that's happening in a certain space in a certain time. But yeah, I don't have a very solid answer <laughs> to that question. I do think that it traverses all three <laughs> of those definitions. Yeah, I agree. And I think context is important. If I saw this film made today, I'm trying to think if I saw this like as an updated version, but like shot for shot and, and it hadn't been made before, I would probably still see it as a dance film, but just not of the narrative. Yeah, just just as more of a choreographic study, I would probably see it and guess like, oh, this came from a school. Like, you know, it definitely has that feel to it where it's very much um, a study. And at the time, it was definitely very cutting edge. And so I would I would give it that category, but with those footnotes. <laughs> I think it's worth noting. Um, and I think a big reason why Maya Darren is so revered specifically within academic circles is that she wrote a lot about her work. Yeah, she like did. she was like the original like dance film entrepreneur, mm -hmm. um, or forgive the term influencer in a way. So like whenever her films would screen, which keep in mind like screening opportunities were so rare for like experimental films in those days, yeah. she would actually create different pamphlets and hand them out and create different manifestos that described her process and arguing why it was a choreographic process and hand those out. So she herself is creating a very specific frame. For by which to review this film. And maybe if you're coming in cold and maybe if you really don't have access to that, then yeah, you definitely see the film in a different way. Like it's maybe not necessarily in a dance oriented way either. So I, I'm still pretty firm with my idea of movement <laughs> film because honestly, and maybe that's just again, like coming from my trained background in film it's just basically, I think it's all about planning. I think there is, with dance films and choreographic films, there is always a plan somewhere involved. And I feel like at that time, it was more focused on the experimental. It's focused in exploring, you know, how do these images match together? How can we move through a space? How can the camera move through a space? And just kind of investigating it afterwards or during where I feel like with a dance film and a choreographic film, you can explore all in the pre-production, the production process, but there's always a plan in the editing process. You know, the intention is to make something afterwards that is going to be intentional to create a story or some kind of image or, you know, beforehand being in the production and dancers are going to dance this routine in this space and then we're going to transition to that space or, you know, through the edit. I think it's all about planning. That's where I draw the line. There's always a planning component in dance and choreography based films and then movement films are the part where we kind of just explore and figure it out. And I think that's like the beginning stages of creating a dance film. Here are some final deadlines coming up this week. Kinetoscope, the International Screen Dance Film Festival in Missoula, Montana, is accepting films. The regular deadline to submit films is Friday, August 14th, with a final deadline coming up in September. The final deadline for the Thessaloniki Cinedance Festival in Greece is coming up this week as well, on August 14th. Details for all open calls can be found in the show notes. All right, our last segment, we're going to talk about pick of the week. Pick of the week is basically uh, one of us picks a great film to feature, even though we talked about a lot of great films here. But this is just our random pick of the week. This week is my week. Check out the film Back and Forth, which is a music video by MK. The film is directed by Finn Keenan. It's fantastic. MK is a really funky kind of musician. And this video is all about just 
what it feels like when you're listening to music. And this one is just back and forth is just so funny. And uh, they actually did everything in camera, which is really cool. I definitely respect the post people that edited all of the trampolines out. I wish I could do something like this. Has Have you guys seen this? Yeah, it's I mean, I'm surprised to hear it was edited in camera. That's impressive. Yeah, a lot of the um, effects were done in camera. But obviously, I mean, they definitely played around with it in post. But it's just such a fun song and just a fun video that, I mean, it just makes you want to go back and forth, we go back and forth, we go. <laughs> so I highly recommend it. And uh, yeah, that video is in the show notes. And I hope you guys like it, too. Anyway, well, uh, it was great talking to you guys. Yes. Always. Well, gal pals. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Uh, frame we'll, friends. We'll talk next. Yeah, frame friends. Uh, <laughs> I'll talk to you guys next week. All right. Yeah. Can't wait. See you then. Frameform is a production of Rixie, hosted by me, Hannah Weber, Claire Schweitzer, and Jen Ray. Edited and mixed by myself and Mason Carlton. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.